One of the best pieces of advice I got from my advisor, from Michael Kramer, was he said, never apologize for the fact that your fundamental motivation is to make sure 200 million kids in India have a better education, and that economics is a tool to get you there, right? I mean, it's a very powerful tool, but it's not an end in itself. Hello, my name is Pranav Kothari. I work at Educational Initiatives, which does a lot of research on how children learn and makes high quality assessments for personalized learning. I'm so excited to have Professor Karthik Mulidharan on the show today. He is one of the most pioneering researchers in the field of education. I want to hear over his last 20 years of work in India and abroad, what are the key messages, what are the key insights that have emerged from research in education? I want to also understand what is good research? What does it take to get into the top academic journals? What is the level of rigor required? And what is the status of this today? And where do we need to do? Where should young researchers should focus their time going forward? Professor Karthik has also spent significant time traveling between the US and India, meeting with policymakers, and is never tired of yet another IS officer changing always coming back with more energy and explaining as to why the policymakers should listen to research that has been compiled over the last two decades. Finally, I want to ask him for advice for young people like me, for young people like you, who are joining the education sector as researchers, as practitioners, as entrepreneurs, as social development organization leaders, as to what advice does he have for us to be happy in life. So glad to have you on the show. Thank you so much for coming, Dr. Professor. Pleasure, Pranav. So Karthik, you know, what has been your personal journey uh, into education research? What got you excited in economics? You know, how, how did you reach where you are today? It's kind of interesting how you can't always plan for these things. I think, you know, uh, my, I grew up in India doing math, science on an engineering track, as you know, most kids in school were. And I think um, around 91, when economic liberalization happened, I was 16 and got really interested in economic policy, thinking about these issues, and um, went to Singapore for my last two years of high school. And I think the, the dominant feeling when I got there was, you know, here was a country that was poorer than India uh, 25 years ago. This is 1965 to 1990. And how 25 years of sensible economic policy have been transformative. And so I think since then, you kind of get obsessed by thinking about the role and importance of good public policy. Um, in kind of transforming the quality of life of, of a country. Mm -hmm. And I think education is always something I've been interested in. In fact, I remember when I was an undergrad at Harvard, um, I think I was about 21, when there was this conference on Indian economic reforms. And Mr. Chidambaram, who was then finance minister in the first United Front government, was giving the keynote. And I remember being you know, probably the youngest person to ask a question and asking a question on the education budget. Right? Like, and so I think uh, uh, influences of Amartya Sen uh, and just you know, personal belief that human capital was kind of transformative and essential to development um, got me interested in education. And then, you know, when I came back to my PhD, it's actually quite fitting that the first speaker in your series was Rukmini Banerjee, because she's been a great inspiration even for me. And I remember this conference in Nimrana in, in late 2001, my first year in my PhD, and there was this um, really kind of two really powerful sessions in education, um, back to back, with literally the who's who, like Rukmini on the practitioner side, Abhijit Banerjee, Michael Kramer, Caroline Hawksby, um, who then both became my advisors. And you just saw, A, how important a subject was, and B, how much there was to be done uh, in terms of how little we knew about effective education and how to improve education quality. Um, and then I think, you know, mm -hmm. I, I kind of got interested and then I got fortunate that I got to work with Michael Kramer, who was my advisor on my first project in education research in India, um, which ended up being this really ambitious cross-country study on teacher and doctor absenteeism in the public sector. And so it was done as part of a larger service delivery research agenda. 
but it gave me a chance to just do uh, incredible amounts of field work in Indian schools. Um, I remember reading the probe report, getting inspired by that, uh, talking to Jean Dres, getting their survey instruments, looking through all of that, and then doing field work in at least five, six, seven states, visiting at least dozens, if not close to 50 schools, uh, testing the survey instruments, seeing schools in different parts of the country. Um, and I think I was just hooked, you know, like, I mean, once you saw that reality, and then I think the, the, the power of research, the power of economic research in particular became apparent because, you know, I think what makes social sector delivery so hard is that, you know, economists don't need to spend too much time worrying about how to produce cars, okay? And that's because you have companies that are facing market prices for the inputs they use, they're facing market prices for what they sell. So if you're not efficient or productive, you get competed out of business, okay? Uh, but in, when you're spending taxpayer money, mm -hmm. I mean, you can spend money badly for a very, very long time. And you know most policymakers mean well, right? Like, I mean, but they don't have data, they don't have evidence, they don't have any kind of inputs on analytical inputs on how to allocate public spending. And when you think about the returns to improving the effectiveness of public spending, so you know they, they're just enormous, right? So people who want to work in education work at multiple levels. You can work at the level of saying I'm going to run a few good schools, or you can say like you know I'm going to provide scholarships to some bright children to go to a better school. But if you really want to work at the system level, like I mean, the impact of improving the efficiency of public spending by even 1% will dwarf, like I mean, almost any of these other kind of initiatives. And so as an economist, I think, as an economist of education, I think you know, I care as much about education as any educationist. But I think the big additional difference of being an economist is you recognize that resources are limited, right? I mean, and so you might often have a wish list of saying, I would like to do all of these things. But in a developing country setting, you always, like, I mean, are lacking. That's true everywhere. I mean, even in developed countries, I mean, there's always more things you want to do than you have money for. And then the question is, how do you decide? And if you line up 20 experts in education, often you will get 20 different opinions, like, you know, and none of these are individually wrong, but unless you have research and evidence on how do you actually figure out cost effectiveness of different things, you just don't know what to prioritize. One of the most important things for me over the past 20 years has been seeing how there is just stunning variation in the cost effectiveness of policies that sound equally sensible sitting in a conference room. So the job of the researcher is to just kind of bring objective evidence into the whole thing. So I've found it incredibly uh, both rewarding in terms of learning about the world. I mean, so the reason you do research is sometimes you do it just for curiosity. You want to learn, like, I mean, how the world works. And in my case, it's always been motivated by policy questions, right? Which is, we live in a world of limited resources. We care enormously about education. And how should we be allocating scarce resources to maximize um, the impact. So, you know, and I've now been doing this for 15, 20 years. <clears throat> As I've grown more senior, um, you know, I now run the global education program for JPAL. So in that role, I see research from around the world. I see grant proposals. We make grants. We review research. Um, so it's an incredibly exciting time, uh, you know, at the intersection of rigor, relevance, and impact. So yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun. Can you sort of you know help unpack what is research in education, the different forms, types of it, uh, especially for a non-technical audience? Mm -hmm. Like you know, how would you sort of explain this? Yeah, so that's a great question, and I think you know, uh, education has been a huge uh, beneficiary of what has been an important trend in economics of the past twenty years of what we might broadly call the credibility revolution, which is basically you know getting much more serious about causal analysis. So, I'll give you a very simple example. So, government of India spends tens of thousands of crores a year on the midday meal scheme, okay? Uh, now, suppose the finance minister were to ask the education minister and saying, you know, we're spending all of this money, can you tell me what has been the impact of this enormously large program? Now, the problem is in government usually, like I mean, they have no way of answering that question, okay? Because the entire government accountability machinery works in terms of, at best, in a culture of a CAG audit, right? Like I mean, which is, you know, was the money sanctioned? Was the money spent appropriately according to norms? Was there corruption? Did the f food reach, okay? Uh, but we are asking a much deeper question, which is what was the impact of this, not whether the program was delivered, right? 
And to get an impact, you need to first have clarity in what are the outcomes that you're hoping to affect. Okay, so it could be, say, you know, attendance because you're getting fed. It could be nutrition, and then hopefully there's some impact on learning outcomes. Now, in practice, what will happen is the governments will rarely have baseline data, okay, on these outcomes, and they'll just start the program. Now, even if you got lucky, okay, let's say there was an NSS round that happened before, and you had some data. And you said, we launched Midday Meals in 2003. Let's look at these outcomes five years later okay, mm -hmm. and see, have there been an improvement in these indicators? Okay. Now, the problem is that those five years are also a period of rapid economic growth. Okay? Right. So there is thousands of other things changing at the same time. Right? Yeah. So parental incomes are changing, attitudes are changing, tastes are changing, awareness of is changing. And so maybe even if you got an improvement, maybe this would have happened anyway. Maybe this had nothing to do with your midday meal program. Okay? Right. So, and this is an incredibly hard problem. So like, you know, in, in the natural sciences, people run controlled experiments in labs where you kind of change the reagents one by one to say, okay, what happens in a controlled lab setting? Now, in the real world, everything changes at the same time, okay? So one of the big kind of advances in research methodology in economics in the past two decades. Now, the method is not new. The method of randomized controlled trials has been around for at least 100 years. And you know people in clinical trials do that regularly. But I think what has been new in economics is kind of bringing that same rigor I mean, to the analysis of effectiveness of policies, right? So, and the basic logic is that most governments do not have the resources to universalize programs from day one, okay? So if you can work with the government to stagger the rollout so that you have a control group and you measure the outcomes in both the treatment and the control group, then over time, any difference can be attributed purely to that program, okay? So, so the gold standard would be to have a randomized control trial where you can have this completely random treatment control. Now, even if you don't have that, you can still do much, much better okay, than simple cross-sectional comparison. So if you look at in Andhra Pradesh, where we collected data on almost 40,000 children learning outcomes year after year after year for five years. Now, what you can see is for every year at the baseline, I know what learning level the child entered with. And at the end of the year, we know what they're leaving with. Okay? Okay. So over five years, we know how much learning gain has happened each year. And, but each year, there has been a difference in the inputs available. Okay, So you have moved from, say, a more qualified teacher to a less qualified teacher. Or you have moved in a place where the school now has built an extra compound wall. Some infrastructure has been added. So what you can do is you can look at the correlation between the value added, right? like I mean, what's been gained that year, with a whole bunch of these other changes that have happened. Now, that's not as good as a randomized experiment, but it's a lot better than just comparing levels. So education research has actually benefited a lot lot, I mean, from the fact that we now and you know, thanks in part to even work like folks in EI did back in the years of improving measurement and testing and measuring learning levels, so that you know we can interpret, um, we can estimate these value-added models. But you know, a lot of people say that RCTs is expensive. You know, people don't want to do the research. There may not be capacity to do it. Um, all of these sort of counter narratives on why do we even we need to do research when we know that feeding kids is good? Like you know, why do you need an RCT for that? The Biggest point of the research is that many things that we thought of as obvious are in fact not that obvious at all and not borne out in the data. Okay, so I'll give you examples not just from studies of things that work, but of studies of things that don't work. Okay, so let's take a very high profile example. So almost everybody thinks at some level that technology is good for instruction, education, and tech. Uh, so, you know, one of the most high profile elements of this was the one laptop per child movement, right? It was almost evangelized as a way of kind of bringing children into the 21st century. Uh, and many countries would just kind of drink the Kool Aid and saying, ye to karna hi hai. Like, I mean, and we need to just spend and do it. Now, fortunately, what happened in Peru was the Inter-American Development Bank, as part of their support to the government to do this, you know, strongly recommended that this be evaluated carefully. Okay, so what they did was they did a randomized control trial where, you know, they phased it in and they used a lottery to decide which phase would happen first, and then they compared outcomes over an extended period, one year, two years, even longer, and basically found zero impact. Okay, so here is this incredibly high-profile one laptop a child program, and they found zero impact on learning. Now. Of course, when you do the postmortem afterwards, like I mean, you people say, "Oh, it was obvious," but that's because giving the hardware did nothing in terms of integrating pedagogy, like I mean, into the platform. Okay. Now, 
all of these things seem obvious afterwards, but the fact is still that hundreds of millions of dollars were spent. Let me give an even more striking example. Okay? In most education systems, the single biggest line item of expenditure is teacher salaries. Okay? And most people with some intuitive sense of education will say that oh, teachers should be paid better, like that will motivate them better and they will work harder and will get better learning outcomes. Okay? And so the government of Indonesia in 2005 passed this major policy change and they tried exactly this, okay? They doubled teacher pay across the board, double, okay? And this was touted as this massive reform that was going to improve kind of teacher motivation and effectiveness and student learning, okay? Now, fortunately, like, I mean, I was, you know, brought into the conversation early to kind of highlight the importance of studying and evaluating and we convinced the government that at least in a subset of schools that they should phase this out and that we should conduct a high quality evaluation. So this was a randomized control trial done across 20 districts of Indonesia, across the whole country and uh, across 360 schools. And what is stunning is that despite the doubling of pay, I mean after two years and three years, we find absolutely zero impact wow. on learning outcomes, Crazy. zero, okay? Um, and so that paper is called double for nothing, all right? Like, I mean, and so, I mean, but think about it, right? That was about 25,000 crores, over $5 billion worth of expenditure. Like, I mean, that is done under the hope and the faith somehow that this is gonna give you impact and gives you zero outcomes. Now, why is that? It's because, again, I'll go back to this example that I gave you, right? When people are spending your own money, if it is not effective, you will quickly change it. But when you're spending taxpayer money, when you're spending somebody else's money, there is no incentive to be cost effective. So what determines policies at a given point in time, whoever shouts the loudest, like Kamheen will usually get the money. So if the unions are saying, like Kamheen, we need more pay, like Kamheen, often that's the path of least resistance. So. And in fact, I remember the former Indonesian finance minister, when I met him two years ago, he had read that paper inside out and he said, how I wish we had this evidence like 10 years ago when this policy was being discussed because this has set us back by many years because we've not had any money left I mean, to do any of the other important things that would have mattered for learning, okay? So many things that seem obvious are in fact not. On the other hand, you have relatively inexpensive interventions that have been you know, consistently effective at improving learning. Um, a very prominent example is Pratham's teaching at the right level kind of programs and initiatives. And, you know, the main realization is that the binding constraint to student learning is that many of them have fallen behind the curriculum, at which point the regular instruction is not making much sense. And so the teaching at the right level, all it's doing is grouping children by their learning level and supplementing with relatively, you know, modestly paid, modestly trained volunteers at the village level, like can mean who are able to deliver very substantial improvements in a very quick period of time. The research has been incredibly valuable like I think in telling us what is working what is not in telling us what the binding constraints are um, so for example let me for our viewers you know spend some time with this one figure which I consider now the single most important figure in all of developing country education and what this is showing us is it's data from Rajasthan that in fact was collected on the Minds Park platform but what it's showing us is that if you look at the x-axis is the, the grade in which the student is enrolled. The y-axis, the 45 degree line, would be where the children would be if they were at a grade appropriate standard. But what you see here, the red line is telling you what the average learning level is, which means that the average student is progressing at about half the rate in the curriculum. But more important is if you look at the dots in that picture, those dots represent individual kids. And so what you're seeing is that when you have children, say, in class 7, or class 8, the variation in learning levels is so striking and that's because partly as a result of a no detention policy, children have been mechanically promoted to higher grades without having earlier grade competences. And once you look at this picture, you understand why almost no intervention in education right now is working because a teacher cannot humanly handle that kind of variation when you have children spanning six grade levels sitting in one classroom. And so, but till you have the data, you don't kind of see the scale of the problem and you keep on kind of trying more of the same like so let's build more classrooms or smart classrooms or put some equipment or you know and these things are not working because the binding constraint is somewhere else okay so the value of the research really like I mean is taking a you know in some ways just an emotionless large sample view at the system and giving us insights about what's working or not. We talked about how you know the large heterogeneity mm -hmm. uh, within the same classroom mm -hmm. is one of the biggest and most important issues in the education sector. Mm -hmm. So how will we fix this? 
it's a, it's a it's a hard problem okay it's a hard problem for education systems in every part of the world okay and that's because most education systems historically have been set up not as education systems but as filtration systems okay um, and frankly if i had to characterize the indian education system there's this cognitive disconnect, okay, which is, you know, you go around the world and you talk about, say, some of the results about low learning levels, and people's instant reaction sometimes is, wait, I thought India had this amazing education system, right? right. I mean, you produce such, so many engineers, you have the CEO of Microsoft, the CEO of Google, like, I mean, they're all coming from India, so clearly you guys have an amazing education system. I think the way to kind of think about this is that what we have is because we've set up a high quality filtration system that if you manage to identify the top 0.01% out of a billion people, I mean, those kids are going to do fantastic things regardless of, you know, like what the education is. So what you have is a filtration system. Whereas if you look at the ability of the system to add value, okay, are we taking every child like I mean to full potential by making him or her better than where they were on a given day? That's where we are miserably failing as a system. And that's because the system is designed based on high stakes exams, based on did you pass the exam? What did you clear into the next level? So it's all filtration, filtration, filtration. And that is a really fundamental problem. So coming back to how do you fix this, I think. You know, there are obviously narrower technical fixes, okay? So you can think about there's a lot of potential in technology-enabled learning that allows personalization and customization and allows content to be geared to a child's learning level. But I think a deeper reform that's needed at a system level is to rethink how we do our exams, okay? Because the tail that wags the dog of the education system is the exam system, because that's what the teachers, the parents, the children, everybody is working towards the exams. Yeah, so I think, you know, c coming to say foundational literacy and numeracy, having modular exams, okay, that allow a child or a parent or a teacher to know, okay, does this child have this skill, okay? So you define a skill at a certain level. So instead of saying you got 28 mark percent or 48 percent on a second grade exam, which frankly is kind of arbitrary, right? Because it all depends on how you define your curricular standard. And it's not that meaningful in terms of helping you make progress on an absolute basis, right? Now, if you have an assessment that says, here is a second grade reading competence, like I mean, and are you below? Are you meeting? Are you exceeding, right? Like I mean, that just gives you very clear benchmarks for you to aspire to on an absolute level. So, and a simple reform like that, I think, will just focus a lot of attention on the, I think, what I think is the single biggest crisis in this country, which is the crisis of foundational literacy and numeracy. And so, uh, and I do this often when I go to the IS Academy, like, I mean, and lecture to senior policymakers. Uh, I will, you know, show them that figure, right? Like, I mean, on, on learning trajectories. And again, we can go back and if you look at this picture, you'll see. Now, now, when the dean in the class la nado la umulta Tamil le pesaram cha. Now, when the yevlo nalla professor da nallu sari. Now, motivated arkhen, qualified arkhen. When the feeling, commitment orda katte kudkare. Anna prize dona me lagya. Na ni when the like class la moon class pinadi yokan drakhe. Like or baarthi um puri liye. So now, when the yevlo nalla katte kudta lom. Prize dona me lagya. Na like me bahashe vaire pesin drakhe. So na yeh apni pandre na. Ipo when the or nimshit ke when the one ke feeling ardu or coin the ke Indian classroom le yepri dano feeling ardu na. So what did I just do? By speaking in Tamil for one minute, the point was to say that I could be the most motivated professor, most well-qualified professor, I'm present in class, I'm teaching with commitment, but it's almost pointless because it's, I might as well be speaking a different language because once you're three grade levels behind, like, I mean, your education is over. So we think about dropouts as a problem. Children are not dropping out. There is still this trope that parents get children to drop out because they need them for labor in the farm or something like that. Nothing could be further from the truth. Okay? Today, there is not a single parent in India who does not want their child to be educated. Right? But children drop out not because they are not learn, not because they don't like, you know, that they don't want to learn. They drop out because sitting in school without understanding a word of what's going on is absolutely miserable. Going forward, you know, what are you most excited about upcoming research in education? So, the two, I mean, let me split that into two things, okay? I'll split that into what I think are some of the most important research questions to be answered, like, I mean, and separately answer what I'm most excited about because, and also explain why those two are not the same because ideally I should be working on only the things I'm, I think are the most important, but there's a reason why there's a slight divergence. So I think, mm -hmm. 
to take a step back, okay, I think when I review 20, 25 years of education research, okay, um, even the non-economists will grudgingly admit, okay, that some of the best and most credible research in education in the past 25 years has been done by economists. And the reason is that the economists have paid much more careful attention to causal inference, like I mean whether it's through the use of experiments or non-experimental methods, but being very, very careful about doing causal inference carefully, okay? So the so the and as an economist like you know i see this okay i see the rigor and the standards in the work that is done by the economists now the downside of that is that the economists have a blind spot in terms of the questions we are interested in so most of the work by economists has focused on questions of say information or pay or incentives or contracting and competition and choice and stuff like that which are questions of generic interest to economists okay but if you care about how do you improve education some of the highest kind of lowest hanging fruit and highest returns may be for research on better pedagogy, better teaching, better classroom practice. Now, the problem is that if you look at the status of education research, where I'm talking about research in pedagogy and effective teaching, you know, frankly, I think we are kind of in the 19th century, right? Like, I mean, uh, education research is probably a bit like where medicine was 100 years ago, like, I mean, in 1910s. And what I mean by that, <laughs> is there are a lot of theories. There are a lot of theories that like, you know, are very popular in education schools. But if you look at where these have been validated, they have been validated in incredibly small samples, often without credible control groups. And even if sometimes you have a control group, these trials are incredibly small, like I mean with samples of say 100 kids, with an implementation of a pedagogy that is done by the person who designed the entire theory and the idea. And then we have absolutely no idea whether that pedagogical approach can be applied by a typical teacher with typical training in a typical class classroom setting. Um, and so where I feel the biggest kind of revolution that's needed is, is in kind of bringing the methods of experimental research into research and pedagogy. Okay, uh, And so specifically, as you know, like I mean, we have talked about setting up a learning lab, like, you know, where the learning lab is an entity that would use the power of technology based instruction to run high frequency micro experiments with A B testing, where you're able to test something as simple as if you want to teach a particular topic, right? What is the right sequence in which to introduce concepts? Do you do a lot of fluency based kind of instruction so that you're learning procedures and algorithms before introducing a concept? Or do you introduce a concept first and then work out fluency? Does this vary? As as a function of children's socioeconomic status? Does this vary as a function of what prior exposure they've had? Can you ex use big data to identify learning styles and then optimize pedagogy? So I think, you know, there is a lot to be done. Uh, the challenge is, I think, some of the best work in this area may be happening inside private firms, like, I mean, that are then keeping that proprietary because that's part of their commercial advantage. And, like, I mean, if you look at what is happening in terms of research in universities, they don't necessarily have access to these same platforms to deploy and test at much larger scales. So, part of, like, one of the things I hope will happen in education research is for some of those partnerships to be built, like, I mean, where you have top quality researchers in terms of methods and understanding theories of learning able to kind of test and validate these ideas in much larger samples so that we can be confident that they work. Now, in terms of my own research, so I have tried to kind of seed the learning lab and get research going along these lines. But in the end, my core competence is as an economist. So that's why there's a slight divergence here between what I am working on, you know, and what I think is the most important. So I really wish there'll be a new generation of education researchers that can mean who are trained in both experimental methods and have the appreciation of issues of pedagogy and learning, like mean and understand theories of learning that they will come test and build a better evidence base with regard to effective teaching and learning particularly low-income setting. So Karthik, we've talked about research, we've also talked about policy. Can you share, you know, the connection between research and policy and your work uh, on, you know, improving the policy in India? The way to think about the impact of research is not usually that of a single study, but a body of work that you then synthesize into saying, here are the robust patterns of what are emerging and how that should guide policy. So one good way to think about the impact of these kind of experimental randomized control trials, high quality education research over the past 15 years, is if you look at the World Development Report in 2018, where the it was education, the signature, it was an education report. And if you look at the studies that are cited there, okay, like then you'll see the majority of those studies were JPAL studies done with high quality randomized control trials. And even people you know, who sometimes criticize RCTs, if you look at the facts that inform their worldview, like I mean, a lot of that are actually coming from the RCTs, okay? <laughs> so like, you know, it's like, <laughs> the, 
<laughs> it's kind of a, there's a bit of a cognitive disconnect there, right? Like, I mean, which is now, but there's a challenge. There's a challenge of research to policy, which is the time frames are different. Okay, and I think the problem is not RCT or not RCT. I think the problem is that. The policymaker operates on a consultant time frame, which is I have two years in office. I don't have the luxury of waiting for four years. Like I mean, till you have finished your study, tell me I want results now. Okay, now that purpose is better served, like you know, by entities like the World Bank, whose job it is, like I mean, to have technical experts or PhDs who are not producing new research but synthesizing the research, like I mean, and drawing those implications for policymakers. Right? There is an arc by which the first five years you focus on actually understanding stuff and then once you understand things then you kind of say there is a dissemination phase and a recommendation phase. Now as an academic I will never cross over into the advocacy phase right because then you kind of say I want this and I'm advocating for this right. So at best you disseminate saying here's the research here's what the research found and when there are moments like a 12th plan you will synthesize and you might make some recommendations okay. Um, so that's been mm, that's been my journey and I think you know uh, what I'm seeing is there is an incredible appetite like I mean among policy makers you know people are genuinely starved for good analytical inputs like I had some incredibly positive reactions the last time I was up at Masuri where people were just saying you know uh, we sitting in government like I mean we never see the value of this kind of research but now that you put together a body of 15 years of work right like I mean we see this and it's a good uh, occasion to actually shout out, uh, give a shout out and, you know, praise to, you know, a very far-sighted bureaucrat like I mean, who enabled a lot of my research. So this was Dr. Ivy Sobarao, who was principal secretary in Andhra Pradesh. And he was quite special in that he was not only a deeply committed education administrator, he had a PhD in education. So he had a research temperament and kind of understood the value of research and understood that he was investing in a research program that would only bear fruit after his time, okay? Because most people will say, I want results in the time when I am in office. And he knew fully well that we were putting in place like a five to 10 year research program that would pay dividends much later. And, you know, again, it's the sagacity of people like that, like, I mean, that have enabled us to create this body of evidence that hopefully, like, you know, now guides a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of our understanding and policy thinking. So Karthik, in terms of, um, you know, where do we go forward uh, in terms of uh, technology and education, uh, the comparative aspects of man and machine? A lot of people have this fear that technology will reduce uh, the importance or the need for a human teacher. Do you think that is likely to pan out? So, you know, there's a there's a very nice paper uh, by Otto Levy and Manane in the Quarterly Journal of Economics in 2004 um, that tries to answer exactly this question, right? I mean, in terms of the role of technology in humans. And I think um, the, so the basic finding of that study, which is across a whole bunch of sectors, but which I think clearly applies to education, is that any task that can be routinized, okay, like I mean, and where you can instruct with an algorithm is something that a computer can potentially and almost certainly will do better than a human, okay. But when there is a task that requires contextual kind of awareness and processing, that the human still does much better than the computer. And in those cases, a well-designed system will allow the technology to make the human much more productive, okay. So I very much believe that education sits in the latter <laughs> group. So I don't see any fear whatsoever, like a mean of a teacher being replaced by a technology. Rather, I think if you, the opportunity here is to kind of deconstruct every task that a teacher does and think about which are the functions that are the most boring, right? I mean, that can be automated. And how do you then use teacher time to do the things that are higher value added that a teacher can do much better than a computer? So to give you a simple example, I think where a technology or computer-based platform can do much better is in terms of customizing instruction uh, in a classroom. How do you handle variation? So even a highly motivated teacher cannot teach 20 different students 20 different things, okay? Um, so that may be something that a computer could do better. But a, a computer could also do grading better, for example, you know, and save the teacher the drudgery of that. But what we increasingly see is that the research in the labor market returns to education make it clear that what increasingly matters are non-academic skills, right? Social skills, pers interpersonal skills, um, psychological skills of grit of being able to deal with adversity. So the role of the teacher, like I mean over time, I see pivoting a lot more towards teaching these kind of 
not, I would say, to the exclusion of, but it's all about relative emphasis, right? Like, I mean, emphasizing much more um, the skills of group work, skills of collaboration, skills of how do you deal with failure, like, I mean, and, you know, working on all of those packages of education that are not just about kind of, you know, cramming you on certain formulas and math. So I think, I see this as a huge opportunity, but of course, with every opportunity, like I mean, it requires work to then kind of reimagine a classroom, reimagine what the structure of instructional time looks like to then leverage the advantage of the technology while pivoting teacher time towards doing things that the teacher would do better than the technology. You are particularly unique in the fact that you live in San Diego, you know, as far away as you can be from uh, Indian state. But you travel back and forth, like you're meeting these government officials, you're training in Masuri, you're an honorary advisor at Niti Aayog, and you have like an infant, uh, you know, two, two very young children. Like, where does time come from? And, you know, can you sort of also tell us how you've replaced blood in your veins with caffeine? <laughs> Yeah, so again, you know, there's a lot of embedded questions in there, right? Like, you know, uh, let me talk first about just the research policy interface, because it's true that a lot of academics, you know, just mainly interested in writing the papers. But um, I remember back when I was in my PhD, I used to feel a little insecure that the academic economics profession doesn't fully value, like, I mean, all the time I spend with policymakers. And, you know, because it's true, there's no academic incentive to do that. Um, but one of the best pieces of advice I got from my advisor, from Michael Kramer, as he said, never apologize for the fact that your fundamental motivation is to make sure 200 million kids in India have a better education, and that economics is a tool to get you there, right? I mean, it's a very powerful tool, but it's not an end in itself, okay? And I think that's just been a unifying principle. And the other related piece of advice he gave is that, like, you know, I said there's a whole variety of researchers and styles, and the reason, like, you know, we have the academic enterprise is to allow people to kind of pursue what they think is important. So the only way you will stay passionate and motivated in a career like this is by doing what really motivates you. And I think that motivation from a very early age has been kind of economic policy and human development in particular. So I think the what seems like a schizophrenia is explained by a very simple thing, which is that the motivation for the research is policy. But the reason I do research is I think that that is by far the most leveraged way that can mean to impact policy, right? So, you know, you can have good or at least that is my comparative advantage, right? Like, I mean, we all have our roles to play. Like, I mean, the system needs all kind of roles. And in fact, my advice for youngsters often, like I mean, is to say that there's many, 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 many ways in which you can have an impact. And what's important is to find the version that you enjoy doing on a day to day basis, right? Like, I mean, because your life is your lived experience and you have to enjoy what you're doing on a daily basis. So, uh, you know, I enjoy the research because it gives me the freedom to think about the most important things, like, I mean, and be in an unconstrained way, like, I mean, saying, I get to allocate my time to answer what I think are the most important questions. Now, that being said, since the motivation is policy, I would be untrue to myself or my own motivations if I didn't then spend the time I do, like I mean, in terms of trying to translate as much of that to kind of broader impact as possible. Um, and so that's why I do this kind of thing. Now, the, the schizophrenia of San Diego versus here, mm, you know, it is interesting. I mean, it's an interesting reflection on the fact that for good or for bad, like, I mean, the cutting edge of research, right, like in most disciplines is still in the US. Uh, and uh, there is a certain critical mass, like, I mean, of the world's you know, leading researchers that are around, say, UCSD or places like that, that makes that a more productive place, like, I mean, for me to really think and write. Okay, so it's almost like, <laughs> I segment my life into the part that's thinking and writing, like I mean when I'm there, thinking, writing, and teaching. Uh, but I spend at least three months a year in India, right? Sometimes longer, because in the summers, you know, coming back to family, I'll come back to that. We were in India the entire two and a half months, the entire summer, based in Chennai, and I was traveling around. And so, you know, that that time I basically am very much in India, like I mean, thinking about, you know, implementation, thinking about policy, talking to, you know, multiple states. And hopefully as a result, having both real evidence to inform policy, but enough ground level understanding to be credible as opposed to somebody who's just, you know, got some academic theories of the world. So yeah, and then in terms of how I make it work and energy and caffeine, you know, I think you know, we've all got different traits. And for some reason, I maybe have been fortunate to have, you know, 
I guess a combination of energy and passion, like you know, I mean, which is which is what keeps me going. Energy and passion, you know, the young people that are looking to join the education sector, uh, be it as researchers or practitioners. What advice do you have for them? The independent of education, independent of this thing. If you look at the research on happiness, okay, and what kind of leads to meaningful lived experiences in life, I think what's clear is that people who are kind of obsessively pursuing a goal, like I mean, but kind of unhappy in the process, right? Like I mean, kind of you obsess about certain goals, like I mean, I want to make so much money, I want to reach this title, I want to reach this thing. You get there and then you actually feel incredibly, like I mean, underwhelmed because it was like all of this was taken. Okay, what's the big deal? Like, you know, I mean, so, the, so living a life like I mean, with kind of goals in terms of, oh, I want to be this or I want to this thing, and sometimes it's not that useful if you're not enjoying the process, okay? Uh, the flip side is like, I mean, if you're kind of very much in the present, okay, I'm going to just enjoy myself, like, I mean, without a sense of goal attraction, then that also kind of becomes meaningless very fast. So I think the broad life advice is whatever you do, like, I mean, try to find something where there's both a goal that you think is worthwhile and the role that you are filling in meeting that goal is something that you enjoy on a day-to-day -day basis, right? There is such a broad spectrum of how one can have a meaningful impact in something, you know, as complex as education, right? Like, I mean, you know, at an individual level, even if people don't work in education, I can imagine you have a corporate job, like, I mean, and be like an after-school mentor, like, I mean, to one or two children, like, you know, for whom you can make a life-changing impact. You know, if you care about education at a slightly larger scale, like, I mean, you could go be a Teach for India fellow, like, I mean, and spend time in a classroom and have that experience of affecting the lives of 20 children. You know, you could run a school. You could kind of, you know, design, come up with new products. You could be an education initiative. You could come up Mindspark, you could be a researcher, you could be an administrator. So there are so many pathways, like I mean, of having positive impact. And I don't think any one of these is superior to anything else because we need all of these kind of pieces to come together. So the main advice is, you know, education is probably still one of the most worthy goals, like I mean, to work towards. Like I mean, it's if you think about the human existence, human experience, um, it is probably the most important part that distinguishes us from being animals, right? Like I mean, so education in terms of a fundamental enabler of human potential, like I mean, is one of the most worthy goals, like can mean to kind of dedicate oneself to and conditional on that kind of find a path that makes you happy on a day-to-day -day basis because that will be your lived experience and you need to get both of those things. So again, for youngsters then I would say like, you know, maybe even rotate through a variety of roles, right? Like can mean and figure out what you enjoy and then that's what you should do. It was so amazing to hear you know, all these advice. I, I think I can, this, I can even take it from myself, you know, even though you don't count me in the youngsters category anymore. <laughs> Uh, but no, a fascinating conversation on you know research and the integration with policy, the need to sort of come, you know, be on the ground uh, and, and be here, but also be there uh, where you have an ecosystem that sort of uh, provides for this. Um, it's amazing takeaways on you know where the biggest problem in Indian education lies, and you know what are some creative ways to solve it, including changing the goalpost like a board exam reform. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Karthik, for being uh, here today. I really enjoyed the conversation and took away a lot. Thank you so much.